So Erica, if you guys have about 12 minutes, right there. With like a couple minutes left, I might pass you a little note that says like wrap it up. But <laughs> that's just so yeah. Yeah. I don't really know how long. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I think we're going to start here in a minute. There are some reserved seats over there for panelists and others, but you're welcome to stay, sit along the wall and in this bull pit here in the, uh, in the middle. Um, good morning once again. My name is Eric Olson. I'm the Associate Director of the Latin America American Program uh, here at the Woodrow Wilson Center, and I want to welcome everyone. I know there will be some other folks joining us along the way. Um, but I wanted to get started because we have a pretty full agenda and I don't want to uh, start uh, too late and get, get further behind. So thank you all for coming this morning. We're delighted today to present the uh, conclusions of a year-long study of the Central America Regional Security Initiative, known otherwise as CARSI, and a discussion about what works and does not work as uh, for the United States and for Central America to face the new uh, face the challenges of security that have really afflicted the region uh, for so long. Our focus has been primarily on the northern triangle countries of Honduras, El Salvador, and uh, Guatemala. We didn't plan it this way, but the humanitarian crisis. Uh, that uh, was triggered by the arrival of tens of thousands of unaccompanied children at the border this past summer, uh, provided us an opportunity uh, to discuss some of the underlying factors for that migration, especially the security situation in the communities that uh, many of these children came from, the vast majority, again, from the Northern Triangle countries. Our analysis has focused on three aspects of the CARSI program. Uh, first, uh, the efforts to build stronger institutions, especially uh, the police and the prosecutors. Uh, secondly, uh, counter-narcotics efforts that are very much a part of the strategy in CARSI. And thirdly, the prevention side, the elements of the program that are designed to help prevent crime before it occurs. We're going to approach this debate or this discussion this morning in two parts. First of all, we're joined by a panel of uh, the researchers who wrote country studies. Um, they will each describe uh, briefly the work they did in uh, the three countries and we'll have a discussion about their analysis of the security situation and CARSI response. The second element in this discussion this morning will be a panel where we bring together uh, the policymakers, in this case, the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Central America at the Department of State, um, uh, Francisco Palmieri, and a representative from USAID, Paloma Adams Allen, who also is in charge, uh, senior advisor on Central America and the Caribbean. And we've also uh, invited one of our participants in the project, Professor Matt Ingram, to be on that panel because his research uh, was much more focused on policy options uh, to respond to the high levels of crime and homicides in Central America. So I don't want to take more time. Um, thank you all again for coming. I'm going to turn it over now to our first panel and our moderator, Peter Mayer, who is probably well known by many of you as a Latin American analyst at Congressional Research Service. He's written extensively about security, U.S. security assistance and uh, Central America. He's, I think, the specialist at CRS on Honduras. Um, so we're delighted to have him here uh, to moderate this panel. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Eric. Uh, thanks for all of you for being here today. I'm going to introduce the panelists quickly. Uh, please refer to the handed up materials for their full bios, um, just so we can get to the presentations and have as much time as possible for questions. So first, we'll start with our researchers. Uh, on the far end, we have Christina 
Gisipal, who is a political scientist and senior fellow at the National Foundation for Development, or FUNDE, in San Salvador. She previously served as the director of the Latin American and Caribbean Center at Florida International University in Miami and has taught at universities worldwide. Next we have Nicholas Phillips, who is a print journalist based in Central America. He has consulted for the Wilson Center and contributed to the New York Times, Global Post, and Southern Pulse, among other media outlets. Next we have Aaron Cortice, who is a student at Yale Law School. He previously worked in Honduras for the, or with the Asociación para una Sociedad Más Justa and the Alianza por la Paz y la Justicia, supporting efforts to promote police and justice sector reform. Finally, with commentary, we have Stephen Dudley, who is the co-director of Insight Crime, which monitors, analyzes, and investigates organized crime in the Americas. He's a former Wilson Center fellow and a longtime reporter, investigator, and consultant. So let's go ahead and start with Christina. Okay. I'm going to stand up so that you can see me. <laughs> okay, well, um, good morning to all, and thank you very much for the opportunity to share with you um, my reflections after having done this, this research in, in El Salvador. Well, it's no news that El Salvador is going through a profound citizen security crisis um, and that the most important markers of this crisis are uh, very high levels of, of violence. Um, it is important to remember, though, or not to forget, that violence has been a constant in Salvadoran history. Um, the, the, the big uh, <coughs> things that have happened, historical markers that have happened, the solution of the, of the colonial collective poverty regime at the end of the 19th century, that's my Latin American side, the massive repression of 1932, indigenous revolt, the military uh, repression of the 70s, and the 10-year armed conflict. That gives us like 150 years of violence, political and, and social. The causes of, this, of the current citizen security debacle are multiple. And uh, it, it, I can give you at the top of my head at least 10. An economic growth strategy that doesn't create enough jobs, therefore promotes informality and migration. Not enough resources spent in social services, particularly public health and education, generalized impunity, corruption at all levels, broken families dependent on remittances, abundance of arms, extended gang violence exacerbated by deported convicts from the US, transnational organized crime and all sorts of trafficking, alcohol and drug consumption, high levels of domestic violence and increasing numbers of hate crimes. As you can see, the problem is immense. And in order to solve it, it we need to make a long-term commitment from all sectors of Salvadoran society to begin with, government, business, and civil society, from others who share responsibility, drug consuming and drug producing countries, and from the international community in the sense of deep in inter governmental and non-governmental cooperation. Uh, that includes foreign aid, but it's more, a lot more than that. You will immediately realize that currency can only be a small part of the complex solution that should be integrated in a more comprehensive regional and bilateral approach. In El Salvador, from the U.S. perspective, the, uh, in my opinion, the other building blocks of the strategy are at least some of them already there. Uh, the most important, the Partnership for Growth, um, USAID Forward and USAID Country Development Cooperation Strategy, and third, the Millennium Challenge Corporation Investment Compact Plan, which are not uh, security oriented per se, but if uh, you share with me the diagnostic that I made before. We need a very comprehensive strategy to deal with the, with the violence. But since scarcity is the piece that today interests you the most, I'll try to answer uh, what seem to be the most frequently asked questions about the program. The first one, is scarcity an, um, an anti-drug strategy? And my answer is yes, albeit 
partially. It has most definitely a drug interdiction dimension, vetted units, uh, units and task forces that work very closely with U.S. agencies, such as Southcom and DEA, and a drug fighting legislation, money laundering, and assets for features laws. However, it doesn't have at all, uh, it doesn't have any public health components regarding drug addiction and uh, violence prevention. Uh, it's <coughs> a second uh, uh, the dimension not as important as the drug interdiction part. Is CARSI a public safety program? My answer is yes. Uh, it has developed model precincts and vetted unit and task forces that represent best practices to be emulated by the local counterparts. It has a capacity building dimension in community training Salvadoran in policing techniques and in intelligence, in better intelligence and evidence gathering. It has uh, an equipment component uh, com uh, of com com stat style and for personal security for uh, police personnel. And it has a dimension of institutional strengthening, particularly of the justice sector and the prison system. It has, and this is, 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 is fairly new and, and quite important, a civil society participation uh, dimension, particularly um, promoted by USAID. Does CARSI represent an alternative vision? Uh, my answer is no. It does not. It is not a citizen security program, it, let alone a citizen security strategy. It is a fairly limited public safety series of measures. Is it a success or a failure? In my opinion, it all depends on the level of analysis you look at it. Uh, if you look at the individual projects, most of them have been a success according to the success uh, criteria established. And uh, the people implementing them in San Salvador from the U.S. side and from the Salvadoran side as well are uh, fairly satisfied with them. But if you situate yourself at the strategic level, it is not, in my opinion, Carsey that you have to consider. It is the larger programs like uh, the uh, the, the partnership for growth uh, that constitutes the, the wider umbrella. And what about PFG? PFG is a very interesting approach. It follows a exper experimental methodology adopted by the OCD countries regarding international cooperation. And it is based on three pillars. Increased cooperation among donors, that is bilateral agencies like USAID, but the Canadian Development Agency, the Spanish Development Agency, and multilateral donors are in Central America, the most important, the EU, and the multilateral banks. But it also includes coordination and cooperation with private donors, such as Gates, Open Society, or Ford Foundations. So it's a, a lot, uh, a, a bigger, uh, still, umbrella. It, it also encourages, this methodology also encourages increased participation from uh, the, the real beneficiaries, not only the, the, um, the intermediaries, and asks for increased transparency and accountability from all parties involved. It is still an experiment, but uh, in my opinion, it is worth uh, following. Regarding security and Central America, in the spirit of the season, let me share with you my wish list to Santa, things that should happen, in my opinion. Let Central American security be seen as a regional public good, benefiting the whole Caribbean basin, including the United States. Help us reframe the drug interdiction regime, particularly the war on drugs strategy. Help us improve human rights, protecting particularly um, migrants, undocumented and in transit. And give us a hand, this is for Santa, and it's a wish, um, in promoting ratification of the Arms Trade Treaty, which will enter into force on December 24th. And um, if we are lucky, we can even get 
again, I wishful thinking, uh, the U.S. to ratify it. Improve collaboration between law enforcement agencies in different countries, simplify extradition processes, and normalize systems of data collection to uh, help with the exchanges, and give us smart borders as opposed to fortified borders. However, uh, and I will end with this, international cooperation cannot and should not replace political will. So my last wish is for Central Americans. We need a stronger tax base, a real commitment against corruption and impunity, more transparency, and increased accountability from all sectors of society. Thank you. So, since CARSI started several years ago, Guatemala has gotten the largest chunk of money. A, because it has the largest population in the region, about 16 million, and B, because it has large challenges. The first thing I'm going to do today is tell you about some of these challenges, briefly, and then we'll talk about some CARSI funded solutions and whether they're working. So, security problems. Number one, Guatemala you're going to hear this a lot today, um, is the problem is drugs. Guatemalans don't consume a lot of drugs, but a lot of drugs move through Guatemala on their way to the United States. The drug traffickers succeed through violence, and they succeed through buying off public officials. So therefore, corruption is another problem. So you've got drug trafficking, corruption. On a smaller scale, but still important, you've got the street gangs like MS-13, DS-8. They're not everywhere. They're concentrated in, in certain urban pockets. Where they are, they cause a lot of problems. They rob, they extort, murder, and sow a lot of fear. So those are some of the actors. In general, Guatemala has one of the highest homicide rates in the world. Extortion is a problem. Uh, by far the most common crime in Guatemala is everyday robbery and theft. So getting your car stolen, getting your purse snatched on the bus. And then sadly, Violence against women is very prevalent in that society. So what happens after these crimes? Well, according to a recent study, 70% of the time, the person doesn't even go to the police. They don't even bother to report it. Why would that be? Well, a majority of Guatemalans don't have a, a lot of faith in their public institutions. The police are not always very well trained or organized or funded, and they don't have a really tight relationship with the folks on the street. The, the public ministry or the prosecutors, they've actually gotten a lot better in the last few years, especially under the leadership of former Attorney General Claudia Passi Pass. But impunity is still very high. In other words, criminals get away with a lot of stuff in Guatemala. And Guatemalans like, know that. They, they feel that. And that brings me to my last point, which is perception. Guatemalans don't always feel very safe in their country. And that is, that has a lot of that ha you know, that has a lot of effects that are harmful. For example, here's something interesting. In a recent s survey of 90, or sorry, 10,000 people in the capital, that's a really big sample, 10,000 people, nine out of 10 had not been a direct victim of a crime in the last eight or so months. But nine out of 10 also said that Guatemala City was an unsafe place to be. So my point is, regardless of what the stats say, like re Guatemalans are afraid, and that has a lot of harmful effects on social cohesion, uh, you know, people don't go out at night as much as they would. They don't trust strangers as much as they would. And so it weakens the community's, like, autoimmune system against crime. So those are, so from this micro street level of people being afraid, all the way up to the macro level of drug traffickers and corrupt officials, Guatemala has a lot of problems. What is CARSI doing to help? The two main managers of CARSI funds are U.S. The United States uh, Agency for International Development, U USAID. The other one is INL, which is the uh, International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Bureau. Everyone just calls it INL. So let's do USAID first. What is USAID doing? USAID has done a really solid job in bolstering the courts in Guatemala. There are many examples. I'm just going to give you one. Start with a bit of context. One big problem with prosecuting really dangerous bad guys is that they're really dangerous bad guys. 
So in the courtroom, they might, they will cause havoc, they'll intimidate witnesses, um, they threaten people, their friends might come and cause a ruckus. So Guatemalans had this idea to create high impact, high impact courtrooms where they're just secure facilities where you can prosecute the really dangerous offenders. They tried, it their own, they tried it on their own, it didn't really work, so USAID came in and invested a lot more money, tweaked the legislation to make it a little better, and they built these courtrooms in Guatemala City, and in the front of the courtroom you've got like this bulletproof glass holding cell where the accused will sit. And they, they can still hear and see what's going on, but they, there's no threat that they're going to hurt anybody, okay? The judges and the lawyers and the clerks, they have a separate entrance, so no one's going to meddle with them. And then in the very back of the courtroom, there's these polarized windows. So witnesses can testify anonymously. You, have, you can actually do that in Guatemalan criminal justice. You can be an anonymous witness. So all these things are part of the high-impact courts. USAID paid to design them and build them. And they've had a pretty good success rate. There's 60, 70 percent conviction rate in those things. And they, the prosecutors have been able to take down some of the Zetas, the Diaciocho gang, and some military men who had committed atrocities during the Civil War. So, oh, and best of all, Guatemala has absorbed the daily operating costs. So we're no longer pumping a lot of money into this. So that's what USAID has done with the courts. On the prevention side, USAID, I wouldn't call it a grand slam, but they're, what they're doing looks really promising. So in their most recent multi-year program, AID went into a bunch of different neighborhoods. And they set up with, you know, with parents, cops, teachers, and priests. They set up every little community they had. A, they formed a little committee, prevention committee. And this committee would identify the problems in their little neighborhood and then come up with steps to address them. Okay? Then AID would fund all their ideas. Okay. So did this work? It looked pretty good. AID, after it was over, AID went in actually halfway in and then also at the end, Eddie went in and to see, they asked folks, do you think your neighborhood has gotten better? And a lot of people said it had. Uh, but these were, my problem with this is that these are subjective impressions. And so I, they should, I think they should use like hard crime data, police data, stuff like that. And AID knows this and they're working on like a, a better yardstick or a measuring tool to more accurately um, gauge what they're doing. And AID knows that. My other hesitation with, with AID's prevention is that it's, some very, pretty small in scale due to the budget that's given to them. So for example, Villa Nueva is a somewhat dangerous suburb of Guatemala City. We, the AID did programs for like 600 kids, but there's 4,000 kids in Villa Nueva. So, you know, I'm, I'm a little afraid we're playing small ball. Um, but I think AID is definitely on the right track and there's, they're, they, they're going the right direction. Now, on the INL side, INL, you have to understand, INL is not the DEA. Their job is not to stop drugs. Their job is to make Guatemala better at stopping drugs. So how do they do that? Most of the time, they work with the police. They try to make the police stronger. So a lot of what, some of what INL does is just advisory. So we've, we've got an advisor down there who right now is revamping the police academy curriculum, like you know, making sure the courses have all the stuff they need. Some of it is technical. We just set up a CEPL, which is like, we have CompStat in this country. It's basically a digital way to find out where the crime hotspots are so that the police can be smarter about where they send police officers. So, so that's the technical thing they do. But the bulk of what INL does is training. Uh, we've trained Guatemalan police in everything from like ballistics, criminal investigation, uh, working better with the community, thinking outside the box, all kinds of stuff. So, one project that I know I think, is, I think has been fairly successful would be PANDA. PANDA is the, the National Anti-Gang Unit. These guys, they do real good police work. They, they don't just round up gang members with tattoos and throw them in jail. They slowly, methodically take video surveillance, they do wiretaps, they build a case, they work with the prosecutors to build a case, and it seems like they've done pretty well. INL gives them all, a lot of their equipment, computers, bulletproof vests, uh, stuff like that. And all, INL also, I think, helps vet them, which these guys have to, every six months, they have to um, take like a lie detector test and uh, to make sure they're not corrupt. So INL really supports that, that, un that special unit. Everyone I interviewed said they think they're doing a good job. That said, I have never seen any kind of general inspector audit of, their, of that unit. For that matter, I've never seen any general inspector audit of the police. So 
you have, I, that's, a, that's a caveat with that. INO also does prevention. And here I'm talking about DARE and GREAT. DARE is Drug Abuse Resistance Education, and GREAT is Gang Resistance Education and Training. In theory, both of these programs sound wonderful. Stay out, you know, stay out of gangs, don't do drugs. Uh, to be blunt, we have no idea if this is working. INO has not done any in impact evaluations for either of these programs. We spend a lot of resources on training officers to be able to do it. So it might not, don't get me wrong, it might be working, but we just don't know. So, that's, so that leads me to my two conclusions. Uh, one is that we've got to better evaluate what we're doing with our car seat money. USAID already does a pretty good job at this. I, there's a new team, INL has a new team down there in Guatemala City. They just arrived over the last year, and they know that they need to evaluate more. They're working on it. Because, you know, frankly, it's not enough just to say, we, hey, we trained 1,000 officers, or we gave them 100 new laptops. That, those are outputs of the program. Those are not outcomes. The outcome is you want, you want lower crime. So the question is not how many officers did we train. The question should be, did our training result in lower crime? So we've got to evaluate CARSI better. Secondly, or sorry, lastly, is buy-in. You know, Guatemala is not a star in the American flag. We cannot unilaterally impose our will there, nor should we really. What we can do is help Guatemalans come up with Guatemalan solutions for Guatemalan problems. AID already is doing a pretty good job at this. INL is moving in that direction, and uh, I hope they do for the sake of um, U.S. taxpayers and for the sake of Guatemalans. Good morning. Thank you for all being here. Uh, similar to Nick, I'm going to go over the situation in Honduras. I'm going to begin a little bit by talking about the current security situation in Honduras and then moving into some of the solutions that CARSI has employed to address a lot of those issues. I'm going to begin, though, with a little bit of an anecdote in regards to what's happening in Honduras right now, because I think it demonstrates a lot of the problems that Honduras is facing as well as some of the difficulties that US, the U.S. has in implementing CARSI. And so about two months ago, the U.S., or rather Honduras, launched this operation against some drug traffickers called the Brothers Valle Valle. And it captured them. They're now in extradition proceedings to the United States. And I think on the one hand, that's a good example of way, a way in which Honduras is actually beginning to address organized crime, especially, honestly, under this new administration. It's now beginning to extradite a number of high-level drug traffickers to the United States, and that is sending a clear message, I think, to drug traffickers in Honduras, which have relative, operated with relative impunity for a long time, that they can't necessarily be doing that. On the flip side, this same operation, uh, as of two days ago, I believe, that Honduran newspapers broke the news essentially that out of the 12 million dollars seized in this operation 1.3 million dollars had magically disappeared uh, at the or due to the work of 22 police officers that made it disappear this operation was undertaken by a unit called the Tigres which I went back and verified this in my notes from multiple interviews is supported by the United States and that Tigres unit took, or at least in terms of training at the very least, I know that. And that Tigres unit basically took $1.3 million and st stuffed it in the bushes. And the news broke a few days ago that they had actually found out that the police officers had done that. So I think that, that this small anecdote demonstrates a couple of things. One, Honduras is beginning to deal with some of its serious organized criminal activities. Extradition is beginning to happen, which is a good thing, because in Honduras, I think, like Nick noted, people aren't necessarily willing to prosecute high-level people, and the murder of many prosecutors in Honduras over the past few years demonstrates why that's a problem. Uh, but it also demonstrates the problems with corruption that Honduras has. The fact that these police officers, which presumably were trained by the US, I, theoretically then vetted as well, also 
engaged in this activity of hiding this money. So I think it, this small anecdote shows a lot of the problems that Honduras currently faces. In addition to that, of course, you have a, the world's highest homicide rate still. That's beginning to go down. A couple weeks ago, uh, the Observatorio de Violencia, the Violence Observatory in Honduras, said that it's probably low 70s, maybe high 60s. The police are saying it's mid 60s. But even from two years ago when the United Nations was saying it's at 90, the Violence Observatory was saying 86, there, there's a clear trend towards going down. And while it's still the highest in the world, I think that we can acknowledge there's at least some limited successes beginning to happen. And that's, I think, in part because of addressing high-level organized crime, uh, maybe gang activity as well, but I think that they have farther to go in that respect than uh, on other issues. And, in, and some of this change, I think, has become about because Honduras has pushed some limited reforms, I think, that are beginning to take effect. But at the same time, I think it continues to face lots of difficulties. A civil society organization in Honduras a week or two ago noted that only 4% of homicides in Honduras reach a conviction. 4%. So there's very little deterrence effect whatsoever in that. And I think that's why you continue to see high impunity rates. But change is, change is happening, uh, but I think that it's slowly in, in a manner that's often faltering and often sort of ridden by corruption, as we see in, in the instance of this unit Tigres, which is a new unit, but still having problems with corruption. So how is the U.S. trying to deal with this? Through CARSI, uh, my report looks first at one of the, I think, most emblematic things of the INL side of CARSI and Honduras, which are vetted units and specifically task forces. For our purposes here, they're relatively similar, but task forces have a slightly different structure. Uh, two of those task forces are the Violent Crimes Task Force and the Financial Crimes Task Force. And I think that the statistics on the one hand show that these units have had some important successes. For example, they've been able to tackle the backlog in a lot of high-level financial crimes and, and take on new ones as well. In the Violent Crimes Unit has tackled and prosecuted a number of LGBT crimes, for example, in Honduras, which I think is commendable on the part of INL. Post-coup in Honduras, the victims of LGBT hate crimes and homicides skyrocketed. And the fact that they've, the U.S. has responded to that and addressed it, and even Honduran LGBT organizations acknowledge that, yes, they have had an impact, and the conviction rate in those types of crimes is higher than the general conviction rate. So I think that that shows that there's a real impact that the U.S. is having in supporting this unit through training, through uh, in some of the ways that Nick mentioned, specifically through training, through the provision of supplies, through the, ad the provision of advisors from the United States. These, th these are things that Honduran police officers don't have otherwise. They don't have vehicles, they often don't have computers, they don't have cameras to investigate crime scenes. And so these basic, this basic support can sort of make a criminal investigation that otherwise wouldn't even happen into one that can lead to a conviction. And I think that that's a very promising thing. On the other hand, I think that it is true that at times the impact of these vetted units and task forces can be, that are supported by the United States can be overstated. And the, when I was trying to write the report, I looked for some statistical data to compare. And for example, the, the Violent Crimes Task Force is supposed to be investigating crimes of reporters. And a report came out, for example, in 2000, in the beginning of this year, 2014, that there was a 95% impunity rate in the crimes of reporters. And that's essentially, for all intents and purposes, the same as the general population impunity rate. And since then, there have been a few more convictions of reporters, so it's, it definitely is actually better now than the general population rate. But even so, I think it suggests that the, the, this, these units, which are theoretically supposed to be able to address all of these crimes, actually can't do so. And so I, th I think it's 
shows that there's definitely some room for improvement in the task force model. Further, I think that that current model is not necessarily sustainable in some ways because it depends upon a few officers who are able to dedicate more times to the more time to the crimes that they can investigate, which certainly is a longer, more or a, a better ter longer term strategy for the Honduran police. But unfortunately, they're drawing, I think, resources away from the larger police. It was it's noted in the report that they take away sometimes the best investigators, that they take that the amount they they have much fewer crimes to prosecute than their counterparts that aren't in vetted units, and so that generates some resentment. And so I think that one of the things that that shows first, like I mentioned, sustainability, and two, that there's an issue with sort of a broader, or an approach of a broader reform within the police. It's these isolated instances of success in vetted units that aren't necessarily going to carry over to transforming the whole police, which is a serious problem, I think. If the United States, over the long term, wants to address this problem, it's going to have to transform the whole police and not just make isolated units. Uh, the, the report also looks at some support of INL to a criminal investigation school, and I think that, for starters, we can all agree that criminal improving criminal investigation is an important thing. It fills an important void in Honduras because there's not any opportunity for ongoing police training, and that's what this criminal investigation school provides. It provides specialized courses in community policing, investigating financial crimes, investigating drug trafficking, extortion, et cetera. So it, prov it provides this important service that otherwise isn't there in Honduras. And in fact, the Hondurans have sort of taken it upon themselves now to run this school for the most part. And that's a really encouraging thing. I think it's a good instance of success from the INL. On the flip side, I, again, touching on a theme that Nick mentioned, I think that there is often a problem in measuring the impact of that school because these police officers receive the training, but then there's no, as far as I can tell anyways, there's no follow-up. Where are these police officers getting assigned? Are they getting assigned to places that where their training would have an impact? High-level officials in the Honduran police say that it has had an impact, and there's anecdotes to suggest that, but I think that more statistical, systematic data is important to verify some of those claims, and without that, it's, it's a little bit difficult to tell, once again, if sort of a broader impact is happening within the police. And then finally, the report looks at outreach centers in Honduras, which is a part of, which is really, I think, in Honduras at least, the centerpiece of USAID's part of CARSI. And what CARSI is seeking to do with these outreach centers is, or it, it's part of its broader strategy of crime prevention. The outreach centers, as I understand them, are sort of the centerpiece in various target communities that USAID has throughout Honduras that it's targeting in order to try to lower the crime in those communities through, th through the use of outreach centers, which reach out to youth. They provide various services like computer classes, g a gym. Sometimes they sh might show a movie. They teach lessons about morals, they provide after-school programs, etc. So they're a good mechanism by which to try to draw kids off of the streets, which is a serious problem in a lot of gang-ridden communities in Honduras. And to USAID's credit, these, these outreach centers are placed in some of Honduras' worst neighborhoods, without a doubt. And I think that that is an important signal. And as well, I think that USAID in contrast to sometimes, I think, with some of the, ev the lack of evaluation that is characteristic of INL actually has, has created a good form of evaluation through the LAPOP surveys uh, through Vanderbilt University. And I think that that's a good instance and maybe one that can be built off of as a way to measure the impact. And it shows that these outreach centers and the other programs that USAID is implementing as well have had a, are beginning to have an impact in some Honduran communities. So to close, I just want to offer a few recommendations and weaknesses, I think, or places essentially that USA, 
or INL and USID can improve in Honduras in implementing CARSI. First, I do want to admit there has definitely been some successes. I think that they're isolated more on the INL side. I think USAID is beginning to show some sort of broad-based success, and I think that's a notable thing. But it, there's a few issues. Sustainability is definitely one with both programs. Mo without a doubt, there, if USAID were to leave right now, these outreach centers would fall apart. And that's a problem. And I think so long term, there needs to be more buy-in from the Honduran government, which leads to the second point, which is something Nick mentioned as well, political will. There definitely needs to be more buy-in from the Honduran government on these crime prevention programs and as well on the law enforcement side of things. Uh, third, or yeah, then third, the measurement of impact, again, I think is a theme that has already been mentioned, but is definitely an issue that needs to be addressed on both sides, but more on the INL side. And then finally, there's issues of coordination. I would see both say both between INL and USAID in the implementation of CARSI and as well between the myriad of vetted units and task forces that exist alongside many similar creations by the Honduran government. And so there needs to be sort of a consensus between CARC between the United States and its CARSI funding and the Honduran government about priorities on issues like that. And that is all. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Wilson Center. Thank you very much for the presenters uh, of an excellent report. Certainly uh, a very micro look at this uh, and necessary. Uh, I think when we're trying to wrap our heads around this idea of CARSI, um, it's a bit difficult because it is this, this kind of uh, uh, amoeba, if you will. And, uh, and it, it, it resembles in a lot of ways um, you know, our, our attempts to grapple with ideas like Plan Colombia and Merida and stuff like that. And I think that leads me kind of to our kind of my first uh, commentary, which would be I think we have incredibly outsized expectations of, of these particular aid, aid programs. Um, and we tend to lump them all into the same category. Uh, we tend to think of them in terms of their, uh, in terms of their money outputs. Um, you know, and, and maybe what we need to do is, is put them into perspective. I think, um, you know, I think uh, the governments in these, in these areas, some of them are putting a lot more of their own resources um, into these programs than, than others. I think the, the example of Guatemala was a good one, just because that's, that's one where you start to see a sort of what they call nationalization of certain, pro of certain projects. Um, and that's kind of the turning the corner, you know, where, where the U.S. can hand it off. Um, in other situations, uh, Colombia, for example, uh, you've got a sort of eight, eight dollars spent by Colombians for every one dollar spent by the U.S. In Mexico, it's even, I think it's ten, about ten dollars in the security budget of Mexico for every one dollar the U.S. spends. Um, these countries, I think, uh, their local governments are spending much less on average than that compared to how much U.S. money is going in there. And they're asking for more money. When they came up recently, they're asking for incredibly outsized sums that they would never, ever receive up in the, in the amounts of $5 billion. You know, a, a complete disconnect between what is the reality here on the ground um, and what they can possibly hope, hope to get from the United States. Um, the second thing about our expectations is <clears throat> these, these projects are going to countries that have, um, and this was mentioned as well, um, that have elites that don't pay taxes, that avoid taxes, that get tax exonerations, and they're depleting on a systematic basis all of their security systems, their justice systems. You know, the, the stories abound in places like Honduras of, you know, the, the, the Ministerio Público people are, are lending their um, printers to the police and, uh, you know, those sorts of things. You know, over and over there's, you know, one one car for every, you know, 50 policemen in Honduras or something like that, and Juan Belacau can correct me on that if I'm wrong. But these are the kinds of things you hear over and over. They're go and the other thing is they're going to countries, this, this aid is going to countries when we're talking about CARSI, uh, that, that are going through incredible social and economic upheaval in the last couple of decades. Um, this is an incredible transition period 
for these countries, where you have entire, entire economies shifting from agrarian, rural-based economies to this sort of, you know, what we would hope in the end would be highly mechanized industrial economies. Um, but they're not there. They're not even close. And, and, and not only that, but these populations are, are having to shift to new circumstances, in particular urban circumstances. These are city-based countries now. This is a major, major shift that we have to keep in mind. And the U.S. has to keep this in mind as well as they're, as they're talking to these countries and pushing these countries to open up their economies and generate jobs. Well, when they open up their economies, they're opening them up to these major, these major shifts. Um, and, and, you know, maybe it's just as much as the USAID and INL have to speak to each other, that, that Commerce and Trade Department also have to speak to State Department. You know, maybe we need to think about this in a much bigger way. Um, part of this transition uh, period that I referred to earlier is also dealing with drug trafficking and, and, and gangs, and I don't need to go into detail here, um, but we know that it is significant and growing in both of those aspects, and these countries are having a very difficult time dealing with that, and again, they're in this transitional period. Um, organized crime is, is permeating the state and political parties and security forces and making implementation of these same projects very difficult. I'll give you an example, very recent example. The, um, um, the UCA, the Central American University in San Salvador, does a, a regular poll, and their most recent poll for December shows that 60% say that community policing will improve their local situation. But a third of those same people polled said that the police are involved in criminal activities. Nine out of ten said that they think there still needs to be a purge in the police. So you've got these sort of these forces that are, that are running into one each other. Um, but this infiltration, I would say, is, is most clearly articulated through things such as public works programs. Um, these are the means, state resources are the means by which these criminal groups um, and corrupt political parties are fostering a new type of elite in the region that is causing major upheaval in how these countries are being run. Capital that supports, this is illicit capital that supports local and national politicians um, as well as the creation of companies that service the state. These local and national politicians, they win their local and national elections and then they channel contracts, state contracts, back into organized crime so that these organized crime groups can then make them make more money and launder their proceeds and in the process build loads of social capital in their areas of operation um, and round and round that merry ground row that merry go round goes uh, the the best example of this and you don't have to um, look very far is is probably Guatemala where you have all the most recent extraditables uh, many of whom are already in the United States, famous names like the Lorenzanas, Juan Chamale, Walter Overdick, all of them had companies, construction companies, concrete companies, um, all of them had strong political affiliations, and all of them had incredible, incredibly healthy amounts of social capital that they built up, building out uh, from this base. This is what's going on in the region, and this is what the United States needs to face when they go in and try and intervene. Um, along those same lines, and this is the second major point I would say, is perhaps our notion of organized crime and how we would expect locals to deal with these issues is not realistic. For these countries, perhaps organized crime is one of the few economic bright spots. Let's do the math. Let's think about Honduras. The Cachiros, very famous group that's been partially dismantled, although none of their top leaders have been arrested yet. When they're initially, the, the, the Honduran government seized some of their properties, U.S. and Honduran authorities estimated that it was in the range of 500 to 800 million dollars worth of capital. Um, that is, um, if I'm not mistaken, a part of, a, you know, it's, uh, I'm doing my math here wrong. I said let's do the math and I'm not doing the math here. Um, it's about, um, about 5% of the GDP of that country, it's about 18 billion. Um, if we look at our basic estimates of, of how much money is being made in drug trafficking, just by transporting 
drugs from the Nicaraguan border to the Guatemalan border inside of Honduras. Our estimates at Inside Crime are in the range of 600 to 800 million dollars a year. That is, uh, in the GDP scale, that is half of what coffee exports make in Honduras. Half. And that is the largest export in Honduras. H how do we face this down? How do we understand this? How do we integrate uh, uh, our sort of aid projects in this environment? How do we expect elites, banking elites and others to sort of back away from this amount of capital? Political parties to kind of take a step back and, and say, well, we're not going to accept that kind of money. You know, these, these are the bigger questions that I think that we have to face. Um, it's, it's, it's not hopeless, but I think we have to take a step back and, and look at this in a different way. And that's, that's really where I would conclude. Um, that, that and, and, and this is what happens when I'm, when I'm reading through this Carsey report. It's great. It's got all these incredible details. But my big takeaway is it's not working. Except for some very limited circumstances, it is not working. So if this, is, if this represents, well, this is just the last five years, I don't think that the, I think the trend lines with how, how we are intervening would stretch back much further, you know, police, judicial systems, those sorts of things. But it's just not working. We need to take a step back and say, why isn't this working? Um, you know, and maybe we need to focus on different things. Um, maybe we need to focus, instead of, uh, instead of saying we're going to build out institutions, we need to focus on um, you know, qu things like quality of life, things like political independence, political space, um, you know, uh, fiscal reform, those sorts of things, fostering foreign investment with social responsibility components attached to them. Um, what I'm trying to say is that I think we need to rethink this notion of, of political and economic will. For me, that's the central question. If we really want to change what's going on in the region, we need to rethink this, these terms that we toss out all the time, political will being probably the most important of them. How do we foster the political will so that these will be long-term changes over, over a period of time in which we are intervening in these countries? Thanks. Great. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks to all of our panelists. Um, we're going to go to Q&A now. Um, I'm going to take my position here at the table to ask the first question, but then we'll go to the audience. Um, so yesterday, I think the, the new omnibus appropriation bill was, was dropped, and it looks like Funding for Central America will increase by about 100 million for the next fiscal year, from 160 million to 260 million for Carsey. Um, that's about a third of what the president was looking for this summer, and it's not even close to what the Central Americans were were looking for um, as well. So, if we can sort of assume that funding resources aren't going to increase dramatically in the, in the near term, anyway. Um, we sort of talked about wish lists earlier for, for Santa Claus. If we had a, a wish list for, for the administration and Congress, um, if you could only pick one item on that list for, in terms of a policy change, whether it's for CARSI itself or some sort of related domestic or foreign policy, what would you tell the administration to change? Should I? Yeah. Um, is this working? Yeah. Um, I think that one of the things that it's, I, I would insist that the problem is a very, very big problem. And to see, and Garci, we have to see it in a limited way as something that has a limited impact. Uh, but one thing that I think it's, it's, it's missing, it's knowledge, is to know what really is going on. Because we work on aggregates. And uh, the situation on the ground is very va variable. You, have, you can have in the same municipality, you can have a neighborhood with very, very high levels of crime, and five miles from there, a neighborhood where there are no crimes, or at least no, no murders. No, I won't say no crimes, no, no murders. In El Salvador, for example, you have um, 262 uh, municipalities, 
and the, the, the murders or homicides are concentrated in 14, 14 on, of 262. And there are 45 municipalities that have not had a homicide in six years. You cannot do, I mean, you have to know very closely, stay very close to the ground and to know what's going on in order to promote different projects. You can, in, in, the, in, the, in the neighborhoods where you have very, very high levels of, of homicides, you cannot have community policing. It's like sending the poor police guys with no cars and no helmets and no, no vests or no anything um, to, to be sitting ducks. But you, you can have community policing in those neighborhoods where you haven't had crime in, in, a lot, in, 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 in many years. So you have to know very closely what's going on on the ground in, in order to tailor your response. And I think that this is not um, going on. There, there, there's the need of a, of a, of a huge effort of getting local data and working with the, with the, with the communities. Sure. I would say beef up prevention and evaluate it to see if it's actually working. I think AID has got a really great idea of going into these communities, having them get together and find out what they think the problems are and what they think the solutions are, and then helping to fund that. Like, you know, in every, in every, so every set of solutions is going to be different because every community is different. But I think uh, that's a really great strategy. I think it, it, there's indications that it's working. And I think, but importantly, we need to follow up and make sure that it's working. That's all I'll say. I would say that, at least for the Honduran context, that corruption definitely needs to be dealt with I, because of what's happened over the past few days with police officers getting involved in corruption again, that's just reminded me of how that continues to be a problem, and I don't think that until you address the problem of corruption in the police, you're going to get buy-in from the people in terms of trust in their police again, and until that happens, you're not going to address the long-term problem of homicides. So I think that, well, and you, INL has tried to do that in Honduras in the past, and it's been a little bit problematic, so I think that there just needs to be some innovative thinking about how to deal with corruption and use some of these resources to do that because it's definitely a problem. Thanks. You want to jump in? No. All right. Okay, if you could go ahead and um, when you, you know, keep your questions to the point and please identify yourself. Yeah, in the front row. Or second row. Yep. Lynn Hammergren. Independent consultant. Is this working? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, two questions. One of them, both uh, Nicholas and Aaron have stressed the sort of lack of coordination between AID and uh, and state. But I think there's lack of coordination within each of those. I mean, AID now has whatever used to be the Demo democracy and governance unit and something called OIT, that which or OTI, sorry, Office of Transition Initiatives, which is now getting into crime prevention. I don't know how it got there. In, in states, you've got INL, but you've also got some little outfit called CSO, which was going to invest $4 million in Honduras to reduce crime over a period of two years. I don't know. Uh, there's also, there's still OPDAT in the Department of Justice and, and Department of Justice and DEA. So there's a, there's a lot of, of uh, there are a lot of, of different units operating and I don't think they're coordinated. So I'd like someone to comment on that. The other one is, although I agree with Stephen, it hasn't worked. I sort of wonder whether collecting taxes will be any more successful than, than fixing uh, the, uh, the institutions. But also having looked at statistics in Honduras and Guatemala, some of which are now available on the web, it is clear that there are some really basic structural problems in these institutions. For example, in Guatemala, the criminal judges schedule five hearings a day, that's pitifully low, and then cancel half of them. Now, whose fault that is, I don't know. Uh, last month, it was because, in part, the government wasn't providing money to transport prisoners to the courts. The, uh, the uh, clearance rates for crimes in the public ministry 
have not improved <laughs> over the last 20 years, I think, uh, despite all this noise about about uh, clearance rates having improved under Claudia Passipas, if you look at them, in fact, impunity is still very high. 55,000 uh, homicides unresolved over the past countable years, and that's uh, almost 10 times what you get in a year. So there are structural problems, and, and either particularly the two who have talked about Honduras and Guatemala, um, if you could comment on how you think AID or anyone else is looking at the structural problems, why the performance of the police and the prosecutors is so minimal. Okay, thank you. The, as to your fr the first comment you made about AID and INL not working together, let me tell you a little story. In the remote western highlands of Guatemala, there, the, there are farm, indigenous farmers who are very, very poor. And for decades they've been growing poppy flowers, which are pretty, but you use them to make heroin. They don't make the heroin, they give the heroin to Mexicans who take it into Mexico and make heroin. So they still grow their traditional crops, like, pop, like maize and potatoes. But uh, poppy is 50, by according to my calculations, 50 times more lucrative, okay? Now, they're not getting rich on this, but they are, they're living a little bit better. But they're still breaking the law. So now, the farmers don't have a lot of moral scruples about breaking this law because in their view, they live in a remote region. They don't feel they get a lot of services from the central government, so why should they follow the central government's laws? But it's still illegal, so the Guatemala police go up there with Carsey money. The Guatemala police go up there like three or four times a year and just cut it all down. But the Guatemala police also feel bad for these farmers, so they don't arrest, they don't arrest anyone. So now we've got this thing where the farmers just kind of see a police raid as the cost of doing business. So we pay the police to go up there and cut, this, cut the flowers down. Then we all leave, and the farmers grow more. Then we go back up there, cut it down, we leave, they grow more. Over and over and over and over. So INL is like doing that. USAID is in the same region, and they're, they're helping farmers do different things, but they're not, there's no central strategy, there, there's no central idea, no central strategy between I, I, USAID and INL to get them to stop growing poppy. If they would work together, I think they might be able to make some headway. But they don't, there's no whole of government strategy to solve that problem. And I think that's a shame in a lot of ways. On your first point in terms of coordination, I think that it, it does seem to be a problem, like I had mentioned. I think, from what I understand, at least in Honduras, weekly meetings occurred between people that were working on CARSI or on security issues. I don't know the substance of those meetings. And I think that, to give an example, I think that, say, more coordination could occur or and if you were to say use vet this is just an example that i thought of before i don't know if it's practical but say use vetted units to target the same neighborhoods where usaid is targeting that seems to make sense to try to attack issues from both sides i think that the weekly meetings tended to focus on model precincts where they're trying to implement community policing from what i understand because they, essentially they both have their hands in that. But in terms of coordination between things like vetted units and crime prevention strategies, I don't think that that really exists. And I think that maybe we need to think of some more innovative ways of trying to do that. I think that, for example, CSO in Honduras did do some very interesting and new things. And it's a little bit different in that respect because it was trying to pursue some new strategies one of which Nick wrote an article for the New York Times on once, which is working basically alongside police officers in communities in, or in crime-ridden communities to help investigate crime. So there's people from civil society, former police officers, are basically working with p actual police officers in the community to prosecute, investigate and prosecute crimes. And it's had a lot of success. So I think that CSO is a little bit different in that respect, that it's trying to explore some new strategies of ways in which violence can be addressed. And I think it's been somewhat successful. In terms of the structural problems, I think that, like I mentioned, it most definitely is a problem. Vetted units are basically isolated from the rest of the police and whole 
realistic institutional reform is not occurring because police officers go to these vetted units and they never leave them, essentially, because they have more benefits there, they have better equipment, they probably have more benefit, they get better pay, and as a result, there's not any turnover into the larger police force, and so it's not having a broader impact upon it. So I think that that criticism is well merited, and I say it in the report multiple times, it needs to be addressed because more holistic reform is not going to occur. And training alone through something like the Criminal Investigation School is not going to do it either. So I think, again, new ways need to be thought of doing that, perhaps trying more purposefully to rotate people in and out of vetted units so that these people come in and go to the institution and maybe have an impact upon it. And in order for that to be successful, you'd also have to address corruption so they're not leaving and going into a corrupt institution. Questions? Sure. I'm um, Margaret Hayes and uh, at Georgetown University. Um, my question it goes to, uh, I think, Steve's point of the need for political buy-in on the part of political leaders, institutional leaders, et cetera. What are we doing, what could we do to enhance uh, or to encourage, because I think the choice is theirs, it's not ours. <laughs> it, it, they have to decide that they wanna, wanna do this. But what strategies do we, might we uh, undertake in, in this area? And uh, then briefly, We've talked about coordination, whole of government in the U.S. environment. What are we doing to coordinate with other donors so that there's a whole of nation strategy, as it as it were, in some of this? Do you want to go? Okay. Um, yeah, I think that you're perfectly right. The buy-in is not a U.S. problem. <laughs> is a Central American problem. Do Central American authorities want to buy in into these, these models? Uh, some do, uh, some don't. That's a, that's a very big problem and, and we don't, and in the correlation of forces as we say in Spanish, we really don't know who uh, is going to win, either the modernizing, um, sectors um, that are in favor of uh, better government or the corrupt that have been there for ages and want uh, things to continue being as uh, and to do business as usual. Um, concerning the, the collaboration with other donors, there are efforts and um, this idea of implementing the OECD strategy of international cooperation and the U.S. Uh, using it as a framework is very positive. It, I, I, I don't know about the case of Honduras and, and Guatemala, but in El Salvador they are. That, that is good. There is a willing um, to 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 coordinate, but still, even if you put, in the case of El Salvador, even if you put all, it, all the international cooperation funds, it's still a minor part of what needs to be spent. Uh, the, the, the big share, like in the case of Colombia or Mexico, the big share of the money has to come from um, the national uh, government. The other actor here that we haven't spoken and that I think it is important to look at are the contractors of USAID. Because we, we say USAID, 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 but actually the people who are doing the programs, the people who are working with the government, the people who are there are not USAID, are CHECHI or RTI or whatever, and they also have their agenda. And they also have to give USAID results, they also have a client boss relationship with USAID. So it's not only the US government and USAID, but the contractors that also have their agenda and to change a little bit the uh, terms 
of the of the relationship. The Salvadorans don't see a U.S. They see an INL person, and they will tell you. They will tell you. Este es el, this one is from the embassy, and this is Chechi, or this is RTI. So, so there there is a, a, a difference there that we have to take into account. So you asked, how can we increase political will? I sorry. Encourage, right, encourage. Uh, I think dangle a big juicy carrot. I think that's the, that's the general gist of the Millennium, Millennium Compact challenge, which is if you do this, if you pass this legislation, and if you clean this up, and if you do X, Y, Z, then you'll get, all, you get a, lot of, a lot of money. The reason why I say that, you know, it's obviously incentives are very important. The reason why I say that is that, especially in the, in the, in the drug area, Guatemala, they, the Guatemalans don't consume drugs. It just goes through there. So, you know, it's, I have heard some resentment among, you know, among them. It's like, this is really your problem. <laughs> you're, you're causing this problem for us. If you want such a big, huge market, like they're sandwiched in between South America and us. And so there's like, I mean, really, what, is it, what, what really does it matter that to, to, to the Guatemalan state if, if farmers are going poppy and giving it to Mexicans, which later gets made to heroin? Really, I mean, it really doesn't matter. So I think, in, sorry? Well, it hasn't really. I may, well, maybe, but my point is, I think it's, I think, create incentives. Was your second question about stra strategy overall? I'm trying to remember so that we address that one as well. Right. I mean, you both mentioned the issue with the lack of tax paying on the part of the elite, and yet uh, that's a big part of the uh, of the uh, resource question. You asked, what what do we do, or can we do to encourage uh, some of these? Yeah, I would reiterate what Nick said. I think that condition or er, incentives, along with increasingly perhaps some conditions tied to the money that gets sent is probably an important thing. And conditions, I say that conditions meaning commitments from the government to, to dedicate money to these issues as well. And I don't think that's a problem. At least in Honduras, it's not. The current administration can get money passed for it if, he, if it wants, and it has this massive discretionary fund from a new tax that it passed a few years ago to dedicate money to these issues if it wants to. So I think that applying conditions is feasible. Good. Can I say something? I, I, would, I, I wouldn't agree. I think that conditions, they, they, they might help. But if you see, for example, the reform of the justice sector in the, the case of El Salvador, the U.S., I, I, I don't have the figure now. But, but I can tell you the years. The U.S. is trying to reform the Salvadoran justice sector, has been trying to reform the Salvadoran justice sector since the 1980. And at that time, in 1982, the USAID program of, um, for, of reform of the justice sector was the biggest uh, program in Latin America. So we are talking about 40 years of incentives and it's still not working. I think that's a good point, so I just want to <laughs> respond to it. I think that, I think when I say conditions, another important facet of that is to work with the local governments to generate their own plans and not for it to be US imposed. So to agree upon those conditions essentially, because I think that is part of the problem is the US comes with a plan, they want to do it a certain way and then those conditions are attached, but maybe it's not actually what the country wants. And I think that is evident, say, in Honduras in the late 90s, I think it was, they, for example, switched their investigative body from their prosecu the prosecuting body to the police. And that's still an issue in Honduras today. They're trying to switch it back to the prosecuting body. It, it, it just seems that perhaps there's, well, Theoretically, I believe it should definitely be in the police. It seems that there's something in Honduras about having it in the prosecuting body that they really, really want or seem to believe in wholeheartedly. And so that's perhaps an example of 
where the countries, the US and Honduras or any of the Northern Triangle countries need to agree upon as well. What is our plan going forward? Because I think that it can often be US imposed. So I think that's a very fair critique. I, mean, I think you can, well, first, I think you, you need to look at this. At the, I think the United States and aid programs and others, I, I think they can take a page out of some of these derivative programs such as OTI, which, for example, I think is much more flexible, much more adaptable on the ground, puts much more conditionality on the aid that it gives, has a much more regular programming um, way uh, approach uh, in terms of, you know, if you meet this, then you will get this, that sort of thing. The USAID, I think, to a certain extent is is stuck almost in concrete in, in many ways and cannot implement these types of flexible programs. So I think that would be the first point. The other thing is in working with other institutions uh, such as Treasury, um, uh, you can implement economic sanctions um, and economic sanctions can be as simple as taking away visas um, and those kinds of signals that you send to the business community can be very strong incentives so those types of incentive programs do exist they they can be legal they can be political in nature as well um, but the U.S. has leverage. One of the good things about the dependency of these countries on the U.S. is that they have more leverage, and they need to use that leverage in the various ways in which they can. And then the, the other thing is to think about it in terms of when, when we are pushing for large-scale implementation of you know, economic um, alliances, um, what kind of conditionalities are we putting into those types of free trade agreements and others? I mean, have we even thought through that process in that way as well? That this, in a holistic way, that this isn't just an economic program that you're setting up. You know, the, the, the only way in which this is going to work is if you tie it into, you know, the social and economic well-being of the countries that are part of this free trade alliance. And I, th I don't think we've gone there yet. I think that that is ripe territory where you can also put conditionality. And I would disagree. I would say you have to have conditions. Absolutely have to have conditions on all aid. And to a certain, ex to a certain extent, I think that um, we, we play this very hard line game when it comes to, oh, well, you know, we cannot under any circumstances promote or have anything to do with a, um, a gang truce. Okay, I'm going to say the words gang truce, all right? We cannot do that in, in, in any way whatsoever. We have an incredibly hard-line stance on that. We don't seem to play that same hardball game when it comes to, um, when it comes to giving aid. And, and I think to a certain extent we need to. And, and then that's where it starts to play into this whole idea of these, these other entities that are the go-betweens. Um, they start to play this sort of strange role perhaps sometimes in that there's an incredible inertia with all of these programs that's very hard to snap in some ways. And that's why I'm pushing my first point, go back to my first point and round it out here. Flexibility, create these incentive programs that they have some sort of flexibility built in. I think we have a couple of more minutes for, ah, oh, suddenly we have so many questions. Maybe we can take a round of a couple and just have the panelists comment as they will. Uh, sure, front row. Yep. Uh, Kim Mailing Clark from AACOM, uh, one of those contractors, sorry. That's okay. um, though we don't, we aren't currently present on the ground, but I was wondering if you could speak to um, the level of distrust that exists within police institutions in Guatemala, in many cases people feel that going to the police about anything is a death sentence. Um, there have been cases where police units were formed and they found out that MS-13 had totally infiltrated it and they were already demanding kickbacks within the unit and that's how they would found out it had been il infiltrated. What are, what are the ways to make institutions, and I've, I've spoken about police, but I think you could also extend that to uh, j judicial institutions. Um, 
how do you make these institutions credible partners to combat violence and crime? Thanks. Uh, Edgar, behind you. Good morning. Edgar Villanueva with the Embassy of Guatemala. Um, I think Christina made a really good um, point when she mentioned partners. And I wanted to, um, I'm not one of the contractors, but I'm one of the beneficiaries. <laughs> um, so do you have a sense or have you gotten a sense during your investigations in the three countries of the real amount of money that is being disbursed, for example, in a poor community in the Western Highlands um, in relation to the amount of money that is left along the way in with uh, partners and experts and, and things like that? Um, we don't have a sense of it and would be really, it would be really good to have a sense on how the money is being distributed. Okay. Uh, yeah, over here in the jacket. Yeah. I am Warren Newton. I'm a Latin American Studies graduate student at George Washington University. Um, I had a question about, um, so if you look at Central America as a whole, it's actually, there's some disparity because the southern countries have, um, for the region, fairly low homicide rates, Costa Rica, Panama, Nicaragua. Um, Costa Rica and Panama have higher human development index, but um, Nicaragua was recently ranked as the most corrupt country in Central America. It's the second poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. Only Haiti surpasses it um, in levels of poverty. And so, and it also has a history of violence, um, the Nicaraguan Revolution. And so it shares a lot of uh, similarities with the countries in the Northern Triangle, yet I believe it has a homicide rate of about 12. Uh, versus, or maybe 13, somewhere around that. Um, so my question is, is despite all these problems or all these similarities that Nicaragua seems to share with Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, what is that country doing differently or is it just sheer luck? Why does it not have this problem with violence and citizen insecurity? And what can, what can the Northern Triangle, if anything, um, apply from, from that example? Thanks. Okay, uh, we'll take one last one back there, sorry. <laughs> Hi, Amy Johnson, I work in international community development. Um, we've talked about helping and we've talked about improvements, um, but I'm looking at the title up there on the slide and, and we haven't really heard much about um, if, there, if you all found anything that was detrimental or anything that, that um, was actually a, a negative impact on the countries. Thanks. Okay, great. Um, so, does everyone have a handle on the question? If not, I can go through them again. But uh, yeah, if you just want to comment on whichever you feel comfortable with, go ahead. Um, well, I, I would like to comment first on the on the Southern Triangle or the Southern countries, Nicaragua and, and Costa Rica, because it's. Um, the ag again, the aggregates are misleading. In Costa Rica, I was in Costa Rica last a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I, I couldn't believe my ears when I heard the news. Um, in one of San Jose's uh, suburbs, um, Desamparados, it's like a lower middle class uh, suburb, they had um, found a cache of arms with M16, UCs, mini UCs, and AK-47, AK, uh, a biggest cache of arms than anything that I had, I had heard of uh, the police finding in, in El Salvador. Not that they don't exist, maybe it's that the police doesn't find them, but anyway. <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, the, they were I, I asked my, my colleagues and researchers were telling me that there are neighborhoods in San Jose and Limon with uh, levels of homicides as high as the ones of the Northern Triangle, close to 60 per 10 per 100,000 uh, murders. So, so that is it, that's the case of Costa Rica. It's a little bit misleading. Again, you have to look at the local level, what's uh, going on. Um, and in the case of Nicaragua, you have two things. There, are, there is a consensus that the police in Nicaragua has been, uh, has had a better approach to the youth uh, violence problem. 
So that's on the positive side. But you also have in Nicaragua half of the country that doesn't have a state, and that's the Atlantic coast. You really don't know what's going on on the Atlantic coast. Um, and m my own intuition is that there's a lot uh, that's going on and that we should know clandestine strip, airstrips, uh, people that are under the jurisdiction, excuse my language, of uh, drug uh, trafficking organizations and very far from um, the Nicaraguan government. The, the, the Atlantic coast in Nicaragua doesn't have even roads. Uh, there are like a two, th 200 miles of uh, paved roads in the half of the country. So that's on the, on the southern cone. On the beneficiaries, I want the question addressed more um, directly to me. It's very difficult. I couldn't say in the rest of the region, but there was a study um, that, I, that I, 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 I have quoted in my, in my, in my paper um, from a, a graduate seminar from the University of Washington. Um, that, and they calculated that uh, around 20% arrives to the be beneficiaries, not the Guatemalan government, but the populations that are getting whatever, the, the training or the capacitación or whatever. So, so there's a difference between the Guatemalan government and the actual people who get the benefit of the international cooperation. I'll, I'll stop there. So quickly, um, yeah. How, so you asked how to build trust, how, how we can, how we can have Guatemalans be more, have more trust in the in the police. I think one thing, as far as the corrupt elements that are in the police, we need a, they need a stronger internal affairs division, and then when they succeed in in rooting out some of those elements, they need to publicize that. Now, there's a little bit of a danger if <laughs> when Guatemala, if, if you're Guatemalan, you re, and then you see the news like, oh. We just got, you know, there's 10 police officers that were really corrupt. Ironically, the takeaway is like, oh, all policemen are corrupt. It's not like, oh, we caught them. You see what I mean? So you need to publicize the fact that you caught them, and then also publicize some good news like, hey, we just did a whole big, we just tested everybody with a polygraph or, you know, whatever, and, and most of them passed. We need to get that out there if that's what's going on, too. Also, the other, th but I think I'm more on a person-person level, on a concrete, every day on the street level. Officers need to stop being so, it'd be better if they were more, if they would talk to people, chat with people more. They're kind of aloof right now. And some of that has to do with the rotation policy. These officers are like, ro they, don't, they don't always work where they live. They're rotated all around the country. And so they don't have a lot of incentive or maybe desire to really get to know people where they're working. So that, those were the two prescriptions I would have. As for you, uh, the gentleman from the uh, Guatemalan Embassy, you asked about partners. I think your question was, if I understood it, is there money being lost with all these middlemen in between mm -hmm. aid money and actual implementation on the ground? I don't have a breakdown financially, but I do know that AID, um, they've started, I think it's called US, USAID Forward. They're starting to go, they're starting to get out of the, you all know about that? Yeah. They're starting to get rid of the middleman and go straight to Guatemalan implementers on the ground. Um, that's great. I think that's a good idea. I'll talk to, talk to you about that a little bit later. Yeah. Okay, briefly. Uh, on the point about that Nick was just addressing, I think that that is an issue. I think with Carsey as a whole, that's an issue. It's not always clear where the money be is being spent and what it's being spent on. And so, at least publicly, it's not. And so I think that a more public release of that data, specifically where it's being spent who has the money definitely needs to happen. And that was something that was frustrating trying to write the report because the actual statistics are pretty sparse. Uh, on the Nicaragua point, I think that Christina got it definitely right. From what I have read, that they have they have a definitely a different model of policing. It's more community-oriented, a community policing model, and that seems to have made a difference. The Nicaraguan jungle on the Atlantic side is definitely an issue, though. I think there's more reports in Honduras, for example, that drug flights will first land in Nicaragua, and then they'll take these little flights over the border to get into Honduras, because Honduras now has some radar that will detect flights coming straight from Colombia. And that suggests that that part of Nicaragua is definitely ungoverned and an issue. And then finally, to the point about hurting, I think that 
the jury still out to a certain extent on vetted units. I think that they have an impact on organized crime and individual cases, but I am not sure they're not having an impact on larger reform and they're even generating resentment among other police officers and taking away resources even at times, good investigators. I think that that's a serious issue and is, while doing some good, it's also, I think, hurting in a few ways. Second, I think long term, if the ways are not found to make some of these programs sustainable, there will be serious hurt because once the funding goes, say for things like outreach centers and a lot of USAID's programs, it it would be difficult to replace them simply with funds from those countries. So things that could be a serious hurt that comes in the future and it needs to be thought about now. Any final thoughts, Stephen? All right. Well, let's thank our panelists and... We're not, we're not really going to take a break. We're just going to shift if you desperately need the restrooms are down here, the coffee, but we want to keep moving because... I've uh, got a lot of ground to cover. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I think we're five minutes over only. Oh.